Good morning, everybody. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I trust that this will be uh, a great final session that we can spend time together. We've had 10 episodes now. It's hard to believe. It seemed like a long hill to climb when we first started this, but we've gone through 10 weeks together, and I want to thank you so much if you've been able to join us for all of those sessions. So uh, in this session, what I thought we would do is to review what we are doing and uh, to refine some of the strategies that uh, we have been talking about. Mike and Fiona are here faithfully. Thank you so much for joining us today, the Gascoins. It's really great to have you. We appreciate all of the times you've been here in everything we do. Hi, Matthew. Good to see you also. So I was just reminding myself uh, what we were aiming to do over these 10 weeks. We are looking at strategies for transforming unwanted same-sex attractions. And that's specifically the emphasis. And um, I'm wondering how many people are thinking, well, we haven't actually spoken a lot about transforming same-sex attractions. And I guess you would be right. I think what I would be saying is that in this area of working with people who come saying they want to leave homosexual or gender trans, uh, uh, gender confusions, um, we're not looking for some exotic therapy. We're not, you know, bringing, we're not going hunting for the one therapy or counseling technique that works for this. Because the truth is, you can bring all sorts of counseling techniques and therapeutic approaches to bear on this topic. So it's going to depend very much on where the person who is doing the counseling or the therapy comes from in terms of how they've been trained and how they approach things. But that's the good news. We're not talking about one exotic approach in all of this. We can use, we can be eclectic and we can choose all sorts of different things to be able to do this work well. So um, <clears throat> we're going to be referring in this session to the 10 different things that we've been doing. But I thought to start with actually where we started with the plan. So a person who's wanting to transform themselves and to leave unwanted same-sex attractions, I offered you this tried and tested plan that Cohen uh, came up with many years ago in 1999. It's something that I use very often in working with clients. In stage one, it's about transitioning. It's about um, looking at behaviors. And we are working with the assumption that if we improve behaviors, if we change behaviors, then very often feelings begin to uh, decline. They go in a different direction because they are replaced. And that's the essence of transformation. It's not about repression. It's about replacing the legitimate need that people have for connection um, with something that is also legitimate and hasn't become sexualized. Because what's happened in this journey, the legitimate need people have for connection becomes sexualized and they think that the emotional need is going to be met by connecting sexually. And this is the, the great fallacy that we are uh, dispelling here. So in stage one, we're talking about cutting off the behaviors 
that just are counterproductive. And the work that we need to be doing is supporting people who want to do that. It's a similar process that needs to happen with anybody who is coming off drugs or is coming off alcohol. We can't pour the alcohol down the sink. We can't cut off the drugs. We can simply facilitate the context in which that is more likely to happen. And we can support them emotionally and, and spiritually as they go through that journey. Welcome, Petro. You're very uh, welcome here today. Thank you for coming. So initially, we have to support people to help them to change their behaviors. And we have to ensure that there is a good support mechanism in place, that they're a part of a community, that they feel secure in their family relationships, if that's possible. But we also supplement um, whatever other relationships they need so that they feel like they are supported in this journey. And then secondly, we need to get to grounding where we continue the support network and we continue helping them to grow their self-esteem and their um, relationship with God, certainly. And we begin to build assertiveness. And that's why we spend quite a bit of time on assertiveness training. Welcome, Michelle. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. It's good to see you. Um, and so assertiveness training has formed quite a big part of what we've been doing after uh, uh, over these last 10 weeks and it's really only as we begin to deal with the behaviors and we begin to work on self-esteem and assertiveness that we can then begin to turn our attention to stages three and four which is about doing the healing work now i'm not going to go through three and four except to say that this is work that is best done with a counselor um, who is trained to support somebody who is facing things in their lives and helping them to uh, look at the causes and what is happening in their lives. That's stages three and four. And that's basically what we did in uh, the very first um, session that we had. Now, when it came to the third week hello peter benjamin very good to see you watching in your garden does that mean it's a sunny day in england it sure isn't here in northern ireland but uh, hopefully it's a great day where you are good to see you pete thank you for coming you'll remember um in the second session that we uh did over the last 10 weeks, we began to talk about attachment hunger. And we said one of the indicators of a struggle that people have when they are involved in unwanted same sex attractions and gender confusions is this deep hunger for connection and this deep hunger for uh, recognition and affirmation. And we spoke about um, how these needs impact on a person's life. The degree to which their needs were satisfied as an infant, we said, determines the extent of attachment hunger that a person experiences. So if attachment hunger is still with us as adults, the chances are there is you know, an area in our lives being indicated here that wasn't resolved when we were children. And how this manifests itself, how we know that we have this attachment hunger is that there's often a fear of abandonment. And you'll see this between people who are hanging on to relationships or friendships in an unhealthy way. And of course, none of us want to be abandoned, but when it becomes a fear that makes us hold on tighter and tighter so that the people we're interacting have no breathing space, then it becomes a problem. 
and it's indicative of separation anxiety. So this is a person who finds it really difficult to live on their own. They feel they can only define themselves when other people are around. They don't perhaps yet have enough of a sense of purpose and destiny. Their goals are shaped by everybody else in life and they're often increasingly compliant. They don't want to show too much of who they are because they're afraid of being rejected. And that that means that ab abandonment and the anxiety of being separated is something that keeps coming up in their lives. And that's why they hang on even more tightly and they don't want to upset the apple cart. So they become increasingly compliant. But strangely, one of the things we said, there's also a recognition of this absurdity. So even though with their heads, they know that what they're doing is, you know, holding on too tightly and not giving other people enough space around them to breathe, they can't do anything about it. So they recognize that there's an absurd kind of relationship going on here. And uh, they, they know they have to do something about it, but they're not sure what they can do. And it's very often the case that attachment hunger is attended by all sorts of patterns of addiction. And you'll remember we spoke about addiction and how to deal with it from different points of view. We spoke about um, a more psychodynamic approach, which is, you know, examining cause and effect, looking at the history that a person has um, experienced in their life, examining closely uh, what is at the root of some of the reactions that we have in our adult lives. And we also looked at a different approach. We looked at the 12-step approach. And you'll remember Michael came um, and helped us with that. And uh, we're grateful for his involvement at that time. So that was all about uh, attachment hunger. And um, we were just really looking at the raw emotions that take place when somebody is experiencing attachment hunger. But um, we need to move in a different direction to understand these things in a more general way. And um, we did this by considering Bowlby and attachment theory. And we kind of whittled it down and summarized the fact that he had spoken about attachments that are anxious, attachments that are avoidant, and attachments that are secure. And of course, the goal in parenting is always to try and present children to the world who are secure in their attachment. They know who they are because they feel content in their relationship uh, with their parents and the world is right because they feel secure in themselves. But the more anxious child um, who just hasn't been able to find his place in the world, well, very often that can be a situation that is going to need some attention among those who feel uh, same-sex attraction, uh, attraction or gender confusion. We can't turn the clocks back. We can't, you know, reconstitute our, uh, our childhoods, but we can recognize what's happened. And then I think we can begin to work in our relationships and in the context that we're working in to try and improve ourselves in that area. I want to go back for a few minutes to, um, again, what we said about how children develop. And I, I hope you're not tired of seeing this. I think it's worth mentioning. We start at number one here. In the first six to nine months, 
months, a child is developing codependently with his or her mother. And this relationship is really important. The father plays a really um, important role in a different way. He's going to be the one that calls the child out, um, or, or especially the son out from a codependent relationship with his mother. He's going to call his son out to recognize that he's part of a wider world and he's going to encourage him to develop his own wings. But of course, little boys take time in getting to that. It's a process of separation. And that's the, the critical task that needs to take place between 18 and 36 months or is generally recognized to take place during that time. So I think we can begin to see if these stages are interrupted, uh, these are possibly points at which issues can begin to come into a person's life that may take them out of a normal trajectory into a place where they are trying to resolve the, the you know, the, the fact that they never were able to separate properly from their mother um, and it's going to be reflected in the relationships that they have in other directions. By age six, we are saying, children really need to have a sense of autonomy. They have, they need to know who they are. They need to sense why they are unique or they need to begin to do that. Of course, they're not gonna be able at age six to have a well-formulated worldview and you know, clarify ex everything about themselves, but they need to have a sense that of who they are as distinct from who their parents are and who everybody else is. And the stronger um, their sense of identity is, probably the better it's going to be for them as they go on in life. But of course, independence is uh, not ultimately the goal because we, we're not islands. We have to work cooperatively with other people. So we're aiming ultimately at interdependence. We're moving, in other words, from codependence through counterdependence to interdependence to independence and then finally to interdependence and that's the place in which we relate well to ourselves and to others that's that's kind of a general model in terms of um, how we consider uh, the process of child development to be so as we went on in our discussions, you'll remember also that we began to talk about emotional dependency. And this is really um, something that often presents itself with people who struggle, particularly with unwanted same-sex attractions. And this is where this awful feeling uh, comes in a person's life where they really are not sure of themselves enough and where they are almost totally dependent on other people to tell them who they are. Of course, that's true for all of us in a sense. We, we speak into the world and we get feedback from other people and that, that's a healthy thing. But for some people, this becomes about depending upon one person. And it, it, it can get to the point where it feels as though I cannot deal with life unless I have that one person in my life. And I would suggest that that is probably the onset of emotional dependency. And if we're not careful, it can really uh, be a difficult area for us in life. I suggested that Howard Halpin's classical book, How to Break Your Addiction to a Person, is something that um, 
those who struggle in this area may be helped with because <clears throat> it certainly does deal with the whole area of attachment um, attachment theory it mentions attachment a hunger um, it describes it as a as a very ancient pain that a person feels this longing for attachment and this um, deep sense of anxiety and fear of rejection all of these things but you'll remember I offered a kind of 12-step approach now this is not the same 12-step um, approach that the caller in episode three uh, mentioned. This, the 12-step approach is a, a pretty a standard approach that is used with different groups um, originated by Alcoholics Anonymous. But this is a, this is a, a, a list of 12 things that um, really this book suggests we need to start to do so breaking your addiction to a person um, you know it's about identifying patterns in our lives how we get into this um, he encourage us encourages us to keep a journal or a log it's a good way to to catch ourselves out so that we begin to see just how much we are dependent on other people and what things we can do to break that um, often I find that clients who keep a journal, who write things down and who just do a kind of stream of consciousness thing, they just write what it is on their hearts, whatever is presenting um, at a particular point in their lives. It often appears that this kind of left brain, right brain interaction, we state the facts and then we process it and our writing kind of brings it together. This can be a very helpful thing that needs uh, to be done. Helpin also suggests writing notes to yourself because, you know, it can be that at one point your mind is clear and then two days later it's the exact opposite. There's no clarity and you're in the the depths of despair it's a good thing on the positive days to write down the positive things that you want to remind yourself of so um many useful things um maybe we should just have a look at a couple more while we're here Make connections with your past. In other words, understand your past, foster a support network, center or ground yourself. In other words, get yourself uh, connected to your world. Take time uh, in terms of setting up your environment, making sure you're happy at home. And um, if, if that's not working out for you, it's probably time to do something that will you know give you the security of your own place in life at home and 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 where you are you know your garden your car your uh whatever it is that is important to you make sure you are well connected and grounded in your circumstances it's really important to get in touch with your body. It's surprising how many people are, are very distant from their own bodies. Um, it's almost as though they live inside a body and there's no connection between the two. You know, listening to music, um, spending time taking care of your body, taking care of your grooming, all of these things are really important if you want to be balanced and uh, to be able to interact well with people around you. Nurture your core being and your sense of self. Of course, you know, for Christians, this is important work. There's a spiritual dimension to all of this and and it's hard to think how it could be done really without a spiritual dimension but um 
it's it's got to be something we take care of i like number nine on this list be aware of what you want we have to have goals we have to know where we are aiming at and what we want to achieve in life um and take your thoughts captive um i know that that is a biblical expression but i don't think it's uh, something that cannot be understood by people who don't necessarily have that point of view. We are exposed to thoughts and ideas uh, that come into our minds. Um, through the media, we are continually bombarded with ideas that we haven't really put um, into uh, our minds. And and so it's important, I think, that we take these things captive and look at them. Yes, uh, Mike is asking, it sounds all very complicated. Is it better that people get the answers themselves? Well, certainly, I think if people are motivated to find answers, uh, that's what it's all about. And sitting them down and giving them a lecture is never going to give them the answers. All we can do is be with them, support them, support them emotionally, support them spiritually, but also give them the suggestions that um, they are, are looking for. Uh, I certainly agree with that. Okay, um, so we looked at emotional dependencies but then we also looked at how we need to communicate in the world. And one of the things that I was asking you to consider is how we communicate with people um, in terms of the, the relationship between aggression, assertion, and a kind of mixture of the two and what i was encouraging us to see that is that assertive communication where i'm able to say what i feel what i think what i need what i want is healthy because it's open and honest and it's it's direct and it contrasts very well with those who would be more aggressive in terms of how they approach things. Um, you'll, you'll hear somebody who is aggressive um, in the way they communicate. They'll have a lot of you statements when they are critical. They'll say, you did this, you did that, you are that. They'll label uh, the people that they are interacting with. They'll use names and they are aggressive because they're highly critical and um, often it's an indication that they have been subjected to acute aggression in their own lives through very critical parents and then they pass this on in terms of how they communicate. <clears throat> Michelle is saying she thinks that 12 steps makes a lot of sense and I think you're right, Michelle, because I think there are people who need structure. They need uh, to be able to go through the different stages. And uh, they need to be able to go from one step to the other with the confidence that they've worked through everything they need to on each step. So I certainly think it's a, it's a very valid way of working. Just back to what we're saying about the passive aggressive. These are, I guess, to characterize this, this is when we are acting as adults like children, where we manipulate, we pout, we, we're not direct, we beat around the bushes, we can resort to sarcasm. Um, very often, what we are doing when we are passive aggressive i mean we may not be name calling we may, may not be uh, using lots of name state or use statements in our interaction with others 
but we hide or we walk away or we um when we're asked what the matter is we say nothing it's kind of a childish approach to dealing with this so there are the kind of range of options i guess that we see that might help us to understand ourselves when we're kind of acting like children or we're acting like the critical parents that we have experienced now it may not literally have been the parents that um, criticize a child so they become in turn aggressive themselves but circumstances in life may have turned them sour or they become uh, very perfectionistic in their outlook and then this is transferred to other people and that's what aggression looks like in communication but when we become assertive when there's a problem in life uh, when things are not going our way if we approach this in an adult way then that's when we become assertive and you know we're free to state what the problem is we're free to point out where we think the other person needs to adjust in a situation but we aren't attacking and we aren't manipulating now what i'm saying folks is that these skills are really important for people who are struggling with same-sex attractions because very often they can get locked down into the childish behavior um, or into behavior that makes them uh, just become very critical and it becomes uh, very difficult for them to build the relationships they want in a normal kind of way and so they feel isolated and i guess that's the upshot of what i'm saying here if we don't learn how to communicate well we become increasingly isolated so the work of somebody who is um, dealing with people who are struggling in this area is very much about upskilling them and encouraging them and helping them to move out of isolation into genuine connection with other people. So that's what the assertiveness training was all about. One of the other things that we spoke about um, in our time together has been uh, the whole idea of um, learning to deal with different groups people who are completely different to ourselves and i i tried to conceptualize this as growing cross-cultural competence you know it's one thing if we gather people who are like-minded around us all all the time i mean that we need to do that that's a good thing to do but a better thing would be to also learn how to communicate with people who are totally different who have different ideas different values um and i think you know that that is a helpful thing to learn to do from a spiritual point of view as well learning how to get um, how to win people how to influence people how to encourage people how to and make ourselves relevant and helpful uh, to other people. I think that's really important. So what I suggested was that in all of our work to improve ourselves and to become more efficient in the societies in which we live, we have to do some work around exploring ourselves. So I offered to you the Jahari window, which talks about the unconscious, the conscious, the public, and the private realms. And what I was arguing is that all of us um, have a foot in each of those areas. There's my private self that is known only to me. There is my public self, which is known to me and to others. And there's also 
my hidden self which is kind of um you know bringing some reality to how i operate in the world my hidden self is kind of hidden to me but it's known to others so i can't see it but others can see it they have a perspective on my personality my communication skills and what's going on with me that's why family and friends are really important because often they can see things that we can't see and that's one of the reasons why we need to be connected and then of course finally there is the unknown self uh, not known to me and not known to anybody else and it's often in those areas that we need some help to uncover what's happened and why we have particular reactions why we have fears um, you know unexplained fears things that we've never really been able to um, pinpoint in terms of where they originated but they see we can see they have an impact in terms of um, of what's happening in our lives i just wanted to catch up for a minute with what some folks are saying here um isolation michelle is saying is the key confining oneself is sending the person into a worse situation real connection is very important to turn this around i think what what is being said here is really important real communication you know the ability to become a bit vulnerable and know when to become vulnerable and who to become vulnerable with that is why the work that we do is very much about building support networks for people if people are going to deal with unwanted same-sex attractions or gender confusions folks these are major issues in a person's life there is no pill to swallow there is no technique or or any one unique approach that will resolve this this is about the whole person and i would say the whole spirit of a person as well so absolutely on the mark there i would say michelle learning how to connect in a real way and and it's interesting, isn't it? How many people who struggle in this area who tell us that they connected falsely. So they, you know, they thought they were going to get intimacy, but it wasn't intimacy because it didn't nourish them internally, emotionally, where the real um, desire is to connect with other people. And, th and that's the big deception. Um, very often, when we get involved with the LGBT uh, community, and, and, and particularly when this becomes promiscuous, we are given this promise that, uh, you know, we are free. We can connect in whatever way we want to. But the problem for some, and I would say for many, is that it really doesn't satisfy. And the more they go at, at uh, this free connection, the less uh, of a sense of a purpose and um, nourishment they have in their lives. So know yourself, I would say. Spend time with yourself. Remember we said that people who become, you know, too compliant, and are at everybody else's bidding are very often the people who have not been in a position to understand themselves and what the issues are that they're dealing with so that was cross-cultural competence um, and it's it's part of the assertiveness training that i think that uh, we should be developing and then you'll remember our work together took us in 
what may be considered um you know quite um unusual directions i spoke a lot about the ancestor syndrome let me just uh, bring something up here that may be helpful to help us remember what we said i suggested and this is really a quotation from a psychiatrist who's written quite extensively on this sometimes depression anxiety low self-esteem perfectionism or survivor guilt are symptoms of replacement child syndrome even though we uh, may not understand the reason for it once we become aware the replacement child syndrome well, 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 sorry, let me try again. Once we become aware of the replacement child syndrome, we may be able to reinterpret what they have been feeling about themselves in an entirely different way. I mean, that's the work of a, a, a counselor, really, is to help them to understand um, what's going on with this idea of a replacement child. So, I've jumped on a bit here, folks. The ancestor syndrome, when we are constantly um, responding to traumas that has happened in the past in our families is what I'm talking about when I speak of ancestor syndrome. And the replacement child syndrome is really just a very nuanced um, perspective on that. Not everybody experiences themselves as a as a replacement child i just used this once this is this as one specific example replacement children can be very resourceful and super achievers in later life because they have learned to draw inner strengths from within themselves as they have asserted their own sense of identity so let's just go and and stay a bit longer with this idea of the ancestor syndrome. Sorry, uh, let me find that again, apologies. So I suggested one thing you might want to try is uh, to connect people with a way of looking at where they occupy life or how they occupy life or the space that they're in and so i suggested um, the use of a social atom you'll remember there are specific conventions about how to do this um a a, a, a square represents something that has no gender a circle represents female um, a triangle represents male and uh, if you check back I haven't got the slide with me now the the lines that we draw connecting these people can emphasize whether there is a strong connection a connection that indicates conflict whether the connection is loving you know it's a good idea to draw your own self social atoms so that you know how you have related maybe to people who are even deceased um, people who have been significant in your life but you don't have to stop just with people you can look at institutions um, you can look at things or ideas that have become important to you i just want to catch up with what some of the people are saying here Mike is saying that connecting people with each other is crucial. Some people really connect with others. They only need to be introduced. There are others who hide away and it's difficult to do anything with them. Well, I'm sure that's true, Mike, but I, I guess that's where, you know, we function um, not as individuals. So we, we can't meet everybody's needs but we can connect those who come for support and help with other people and i think this is what i am trying to say in terms of helping them to build to build a support net network obviously 
if you are somebody who wants to care there's only a certain amount you can do it it's like you and i we have to teach people how to fish we can give them the fish they can enjoy the fish they can cook the fish but if we keep giving them the fish and don't teach them how to go and catch the fish well it's you know it's not as good so we have to link people in we have to bring them into community so um vanya you're just asking what the relevance of the different shapes are just to go back to this to uh, make it a bit more clear um the triangles are males the circles are females the dotted line there for example around the the grandpa means that he's deceased um the square represents things that have no gender so they you know they are neither male nor female um that's what the social atom is all about it's a whole kind of science on its own and i'm pretty sure if you look on youtube or you go onto the net and you look at some sources um you'll find some good information about this check the work of j l moreno the founder of psychodrama not one who i would particularly follow in terms of his theology but in terms of his understanding of how groups work i think uh, he's one to follow and the social atoms come from what we call sociometry which was very much the invention of jl moreno so if you look up uh, sociometry uh, it's this you know this ability to understand how groups work when you walk into a group and you feel drawn to one set of people and you want to get a, away from another group of people or a person and maybe you've you've never even met them it's it's indicative that there is you know this kind of a radar that works within all of us and actually um that radar is very telling and if somebody's been well trained in terms of group psychotherapy or you know the group dynamics that are always present in a group it's possible to um you know harness what is happening in those moments and they it can be really helpful and constructive in helping us to understand what's happening so mike when when people shy away you know that's something to work on that's something to help the person to understand that they're doing that and it's probably a good thing to help them to understand why it's happening now you know that's not necessarily work for everyone but that would certainly be work i would want to do with a client who said he he's on the periphery he just you know he he just can't get into a group or he doesn't know how to begin dating women uh now that he's dealt with his behaviors that were going in the wrong direction he really fears going in the direction of making contact with women even though his head tells him that's what he wants to do um why is this happening that's that's the work that we do here so I hope that answers uh, something of the issues you're raising, Mike, and also Vanya. I hope you have a better, you know, you know what we're talking about uh, when it comes to the social atom. It's just another tool. It's like the Jahari window that helps us to understand the different, you know, the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious, the private and the public. The social atom is another tool that can help us to understand uh, how we relate to the world. So folks, um, you'll remember finally in our study together, if I can find it, yes, here we are. We dealt with trauma. Um, and I'm just, bring this up as a reminder last week 
I invited Dr. Anne Gillies. Anne is a trauma specialist operating in Canada, or that's where most of her work uh, was done, I believe. I think there was some done in the USA as well. She is going on into retirement at the moment. Um, but Anne helped us maybe to just get a view on trauma and to recognize that trauma really does need to be dealt with. Um, I spoke about small t and big t trauma. And my purpose in bringing Anne was just to hear, um, you know, the important work that needs to be done and that this is something that people specialize in. So those who've experienced, um, you know, intrusive things that have been abusive in their lives, whether it's emotional abuse or sexual abuse, those who've been exposed to trauma because of war situations, um, those who have been deprived, those who have, um, you know, had to be forced to leave their country. Um, these are often things that impact on our lives and can also be um, a part of why we turn in the direction that we do that we later regret. Um, so it's important to be aware of where we can get help and trauma is certainly something that we need to be sensitive to in a person's life we need to know how to listen to it and then when we've heard it uh, that it's there we need to know how to refer that on to a specialist who can deal with it properly um, if it's not something that we can do but even if we're not therapists we can surely be there for people we can love them we can serve them we can encourage them we can help them to feel grounded in their circumstances i think all of those things are really important okay folks so now i just wanted to do one more thing because we've come to the end of our 10 weeks i've tried to map out the ways in which we do our work, um, what are the strategies that we would use to transform ourselves when we have these issues or we are working with people who want to transform themselves. I've hopefully given you a flavor of the kinds of things we're dealing with and some of the tools uh, that we need to, um, we need to use uh in 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 dealing with it but there is one thing i wanted to say to you folks as we now you know go into a world where uh increasingly there is a threat to close down therapeutic choice so you know this idea that you cannot go to somebody who has a similar world view to you. Uh, you cannot go to somebody who agrees with you that homosexuality is not, you know, the best choice in life, that gender issues really do, um, you know, as somebody said recently, um, transforming yourself and transitioning from your birth gender into your chosen gender doesn't deal with the dysphoria maybe for some it does but for the people who come in our direction they sit with the dysphoria even when they've gone through the transition and that's why they detransition and go back to their birth gender the dysphoria is still there so there you know there are emotional issues that need to be dealt with. Now, what I wanted to do, folks, and for some reason, I just cannot find the slide that I wanted to show you. Um, let me just, well, I just can't do it because there's no time. What I wanted to say to you is please do follow 
the work of the International Federation for Therapeutic and Counseling Choice. Just go iftcc.org. This is where people far better qualified and with far more experience than I have come together to talk about these issues. And what I wanted to say to you is, even though we've come to the end of this series, I hope within the next two or three weeks, we are going to be able to relaunch and to bring in some of the experts, some of the lawyers, some of the therapists, some of the spiritual leaders who have got something to say about this issue. It seems to me that the mainstream media just are not interested in telling the story that we're, we're, that brings us together today. So I think it's important we find our own way of sticking together, upskilling ourselves, and making sure that, you know, what we do, how we think, and how we work is based on good scientific understanding, good practice, and is steeped in ethical principles that you and I believe in. Now, it's my joy to know that there are so many people in the world who support us. And, you know, I'm really encouraged because this little series has reached in Facebook an enormous number of people now. And um, it's been encouraging to get feedback and to hear what people are saying about it. So the next series, I hope, is going to be much more broad. Um, it's going to listen to many different perspectives and points of view and experience a lot more um, input from other people. So thank you so much for coming. Vanya, you're so encouraging. She says this course has been insightful, and she thanks us, uh, me for this input. I really appreciate it that and michelle thank you for your comments um thank you ali didn't mention you thank you for coming and being here so what we will do is make announcements on facebook as soon as the next series is ready i hope it will be um, an important opportunity to gather again and come together and think through these issues please raise your issues your concerns let us know what we can do uh, to make this topic relevant and important for you. My prayer today is that you will have opportunity to su support other people, that you'll be there for them. Even if you don't have the answers, friends, the fact that you are there will really count. It doesn't matter if you're older or younger, whether, you know, it just doesn't matter they will know if you are there for them. And that caring support, especially for those who um, are in the LGBT community and are looking for answers and looking for directions. Friends, you certainly can be there to help them. So thank you so much for coming. Mike Gascoigne and Fiona, thank you for being here, all of those who's attended uh, throughout the 10 weeks, or just some of them, Peter Benjamin, great to have you today. God bless you, and thanks again for being with us. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for...